Thomas Knauer Design Studio is sponsored by Old City Quilts. Discover quilting paradise between New York and D.C. Hello and welcome to Design Studio with Thomas Knauer. I'm Thomas Knauer and today I'm going to be talking about minimalism. Um, I think in the quilting world, minimalism is a sort of tradition and practice that's perhaps misunderstood a lot of the time. Uh, we have a certain conception of what minimalism in art was about or has been, much of that really coming from mid-century modernism, those super crisp, minimalist, uh, single color canvases. But there's really so much more to the tradition, both in art and in quilting. Uh, minimalism is really not so much a formal practice, but it's a conceptual practice. In reducing a design down to fewer and fewer elements, perhaps even down to what appears to be a single color, what you're doing, what those artists were doing was clearing out space for subtleties, for little nuances and details and ideas to come through and take a more prominent place. A small dab of color in one little spot, perhaps an awkward spot in a canvas filled with hundreds and hundreds of colors, is not going to draw much attention or much notice, whereas on a pure white canvas, that one little dot of red completely transforms the geometry. And then we're left to sort of notice that this minor thing, this tiny little accident or tiny choice completely reframes what we're seeing and what we're thinking. And I think minimalism in so many ways is this really wonderful, sort of beautiful metaphor or even allegory for the way our lives work. So often it is the small, smallest elements, the littlest things that can completely transform a life. That I'm, you know, if you have kids or no kids, I'm sure you've all had moments, a simple gesture from a child can be absolutely enormous, but that really wouldn't be a big complicated thing. It is that at that moment you took time out of your life to pause and notice that detail. And to me, that's what minimalism is really about. There are endless formal ways of handling that, and we'll look at a lot of those today, but really what minimalism is doing is translating, translating the small and finding a way to make it significant. So we're gonna start with a prototypical, perhaps sort of minimalist, space, just purple, a purple square. Um, it is what it is, and it's not doing much, at least in terms of our top design, our piecing. So I want to look at sort of progressively disrupting that space more and more, bringing in other variations, other options. The simplest one would be just simply cutting it in half. By splitting that space with these two related tones, we're already seeing it went from being a totality, a whole thing that just was, to now it's this duality. There's in fact a whole lot of visual tension, at least to my eye, going on by that strict and simple division. And other things of changing that from a vertical to a horizontal axis really moves it from being this tension relationship to now it seems to reference more of a landscape or a horizon line. It takes on a lot more calm on that horizontal than it does the vertical and even changing sides of the relationship. And then it comes from, there's a reason why, okay, in your printer, you have a setting which way the paper should be oriented relative to the image. One is called landscape, and we tend to read horizontal as landscape, and the other is called portrait. Vertical things we relate to our bodies, our positionality as humans. And I think with minimalist designs, that plays in as well. And I do love designs like this, um, in that, to me, a bed quilt that's just a two split speaks to the idea of the two bodies in the bed, 
it's a queen, you know, it's a, for a queen or a shared bed, the two bodies in the bed that are different but unified by the totality. And that's what I mean by subtle references that can come forward in the minimalist process. Even just this one split there, now we are that playing off of that idea of quilt relating to the bodies in the bed, now we've really split these two positions. We're not really together. There is this perhaps a demilitarized zone between us. And that speaks sort of much of a, to me a powerful sort of notion and idea. Whereas this, we move it off here. Now we have that still a split, but one's lar much larger than the other. And we have this off balance relationship. And what might that speak about or speak to if this imbalance in the space versus that perfect balance of the splitting in half? And again, we have a very different landscape reference and feel. Here, perhaps the sky is much more prominent or evident, or vice versa, depending on which way we rotate. And that might speak to a very different space. Me coming from New York, Upstate, it's much more of a middle horizon line, but when I landed at the Denver airport today, or earlier, um, I noticed that wide, wide landscape versus then this big, big sky. The landscape was out, but felt small relative to the sky. So you can even just get the feel of a place with these minimal, minimal gestures. Now, what I really like doing with a minimalist quilt is to really play with tonality, play with lots and lots of subtle color shifts, bringing in little breaks, disruptions. We start playing some color in, perhaps playing with different shape relationships, thinking about even things like this as we'll see, seems to me are very, very important with minimalism. There's a big difference between these two squares together and you see that little subtle break than just dropping in a rectangle. And that's where, again, every nuance when working with minimalism starts to have room to become important. Not that you have to consider and overanalyze each decision, but you can play with those decisions until it starts to feel like what you're thinking. So we bring in more colors, a bit of another lighter one. I'll put it right here. Lots and lots of squares going here, there, everywhere, fragmenting the space. But now this space is, while tonally relatively closely packed, has become very complicated visually. And that's where I like with a lot of minimalist designs might be based on a grid, but then having elements that bridge across the grid. So we have directionality in the composition playing in. So I'm not just going pop, 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 pop through the grid with these squares. We have rectangular elements that start drawing the eye across the space so in fact, you're getting a very activated visual space, building up some genuine negative spaces, forms being formed amidst all of those tonal variations. But it still has that essential holistic sense of being this one continual whole. And that's why I think about designing for minimalist ideas is I often will start like I did with paper here, at least on my design wall or in my head, with one color of cloth. Most commonly, I would actually use a mid-tone and then use lighter and darker to push and pull against it. But what we're doing is, is how far can I stretch from that totality at, with these little, little nuances but still maintain that whole enough? And so minimalism becomes this process of playing back and forth between detail and whole. And in that relationship, we start to produce the tensions, both visually and conceptually, that make the minimalist tradition an incredibly rich and elegant and sophisticated process of design that goes far beyond just being simple.
So we've been talking thus far with minimalism largely about structure, the way the pieces come together to form a more nuanced minimalist space, but largely within a very narrow tonal range. One of the great sort of elements for minimalism is to then add those little or those extreme differences, those small but big differences that really make a pop. And those have two big purposes. One is they give a real point of emphasis. OK, what is it about that piece being there, that color being chosen? What does that do to really reframe how we see the space? But as we'll see in just a second, what it also does is relatively quickly begins to compress those, those tonally varied ground colors, the, the basic color. The blues will begin to feel much more connected, or the purples will feel much more connected to each other once we get a wider variety of color playing in. So once we do this, we now have a much calmer set of colors for the purples because relative to the extreme color difference, those feel much more similar than they did when they were just isolated. Also, you can see what I've done now with these color pops is I've really integrated another layer of directional elements. We have some of it playing with the tonals, but then these pops start to produce visual relationships with each other, move back and forth between each other, and create a larger set of paths through the design. So what that's doing, of even though our palette and shape system is very simple, we're getting the eye to keep moving around a lot, which that means your brain is also relating to the design for more time. And so then those nuances and any further subtleties really have room to come forward because you're engaged a little bit longer. And that's one of the big differences between, say, that notion of a simple, just purple, one piece, there's not, nothing grabbing you, playing with the eye versus the brain to keep thought and engagement and just visual pleasure going on. We can still keep to that basic notion of that whole and that tonal minimalism and simple shapes, but really produce more time for the quilt and the subtleties to come forward. So at this point, we can see that we now need to figure out how we're actually going to piece this. It's clear that we don't have any self-evident blocks that can be easily seen, or we have problems because of these larger rectangles. We have to figure out we can't do it in just rows or columns. We need to figure out a piecing plan. And that's where I go to just a little bit of tracing paper, carefully overlay it. And what you're looking for are the elements you're going to have to piece. We're breaking it down into sub-elements. So the first self-evident ones are these smaller rectangles. I'm going to have to piece those into squares to start already with those squares in place. You start, forms will start to emerge. I can then piece this group. So now I have rectangle, rectangle, rectangle. That becomes an easy unit. Here we see, hey, here's a great little quadrant right there. These two, that group, that group. Same down here actually turns into a perfectly manageable block by piecing these four together, then adding this one, and then finally piece those to the top. And same strategy for this, row, row, row. So piecing can still be very easy, even though we're doing lots of row and column breaks. It just becomes about finding the structure and then seeing what needs to be assembled when but we can still stick to incredibly easy piecing. So as we move forward, then we can look at an actual quilt. And we can see this plane of the modularity of the colors. 
we have our pops of color that move the eye in different directions relative to each other. Down, down, these pushing us in, these moving us side to side, this one pulling us back up, even as that one stops us from going all the way down, this one pulls us back up. So it's about producing movement and those pops of color um, really bring the yellows closer to each other. Your quilting can also do a lot of that. By stitching this with white, I just sort of homogenize it all a little bit. Yes, it shows a little bit more in the yellow, the bright yellow than it does in the super pale, but it really just sort of homogenizes that space once it's quilted down. And in this one I used purely regulated quarter inch or eighth inch, quarter inch straight line quilting because I really wanted that even space behind to then let quilting changes pop forward as well as the color changes. Now on this one there's also a, another subtle little thing. You'll see all of these seams really kind of pop forward. And that happens because, and this is a lovely thing I'm using, starting to use more and more, is this was quilted or pieced with uh, a middle gray thread. And that darker thread shows the seams off a little bit more. It'd be like using a black batting in some ways behind a quilt to get things to pop out, to get the seams to pop more. Here, just using a, dar a darker thread, or if you're using dark colors, a light thread, you can bring the seams out, which to me are, again, another wonderful nuance of a, within a minimalist palette, is we see all the colors joining together, but the grid that underlies it all is reinforced. And that's where thread and stitching and minimalism become, to me, unbelievably important. In this one, I went with a very geometric straight line, but we look at this quilt, and we have over that minimalist palette, I quilted a representation, or really a precise redoing of a manhole cover that my daughter and I found on a vacation to Oslo. And so it's really then stitching a memory into that space, but the, all of that quilting, if it were done over a really complicated, tonally varied patchwork, would disappear. It has a more subtle tonal range, but then the quilting begins to come forward. And that's really what, for me, minimalism really does in the quilting world, is it really lets what the quilting is, not just the forms, but what one might say about the quilt with the quilting come, to come forward. And with this quilt that I made for my wife, we start to see a lot of those, of the issues of minimalism between the piecing and the quilting, color pops and shapes, all start to come together to really look at what minimalism can do and what then the quilts can be about when using that, um, that vocabulary. With this one, it starts with the word plight from our vows, and thereto I plight thee my troth, done in braille. And that is where, when we're in bed together and the baby is in bed with us, the baby sleeps here, right between us. Then my wife would inevitably curl up and around. Her head would be above and then nestling around and curling around him. And then I inevitably would come back down a little bit lower and wrap my knees. And we just instinctively found ourselves cradling our child. And that's really with these few gestures, we can get a whole lot of narrative, a whole lot of story into the quilt with this very minimalist vocabulary. But really what this quilt is about is really clearing out space for the quilting. This one is quilted with our wedding vows in three quarter inch high letters. But we've, I've written the vows into the quilt so that they really become part of the texture, the fabric, the essence of the quilt instead of being a overt design element. And then doing that in the blue means that the quilting can just sort of recede and be texture, 
But here's another part where color pops or color variations in a minimalist design can really then become useful with the quilting because it's over those color differences that we can really see the typography of the quilting pop forward even as it's receded everywhere else in the ground. And so we can see now how we're building up a very complex and a rich visual and conceptual structure, but with this very simple, succinct, that's probably a better word than simple, a succinct visual palette. When working with the quilting for a minimalist composition, that's really where I do see that opportunity to play with systems or relationships or even ideas for the quilting that would just disappear in a more complicated, pieced, colorful quilt. That simplicity or that just tonality or the sp open spaces in a minimalist quilt really let me move on to really think about what little nuanced things do I want to do? A lot of the time I will work with text or codes. I do a lot with translating text into various codes. And today I'm going to play a little bit with a bit of quilting based on Braille. And, but using that just to illustrate how the, the little bits of it that would disappear can really pop forward and the quilting takes on a prominent role. So I'm going to bring my machine over. And for this, I'm going to be using the computer feature on this because with a lot of my quilts, and especially the minimalist-based ones, I like to develop very complicated quilting systems. They may not be necessarily stitchery complicated, but they may be enormously convoluted and complicated that would really exclude doing ruler work reasonably or any other method besides marking every single line on the quilt, which would just drive you crazy. So that is where the computer comes into play. And I'm just going to bring it into place and let it begin its process. It's going to first pull up a stitch. And then I can start to let her go. So what we're going to see here is this is a quilting system I designed based on Braille. Um, um, and it spells out the word always in a system of Braille. And it'll begin looking like pretty much nothing, these tiny little nubs. And I often like developing processes that sort of feel essentially like a stipple or a variation of a stipple playing in with straight lines but something that's very textural, but within that is then something that's really quite significant. And so now that it's finished, we can see the quilting system that's been, quilt, been managed by the computer. And you can start to see right here, we would have two rows or two columns, and we have a, a dot in the first position and a space and a space, and that's the letter A in Braille. And so coming this way, it spells always. And so that's where, again, this really subtle play in the quilting would really not come out well in a complicated quilt, but that minimalist space really lets the quilting jump forward. Now this one obviously has been shrunk down versus being used over a larger quilt, so it's incredibly tight. But one last thing I want to note is I love leaving my stitch length for a perfect precision geometric sort of system a little bit looser than it might be otherwise or it ought to be. So I actually get a certain degree of organic feel to each of those depending on where the stitch is hitting relative to the angles and the geometry. So it get, again, gets a bit more of that feel and play mixed into that geometry. Um, so now we're going to move on to looking at working with binding within a minimalist structure. <laughs> 
This is a place where we have a couple of simple decisions, really. The base decision is, do I want to frame it with a hard frame, or do I want it to sort of expand outward? And that's where using a same tone at the edge would just make it feel like the quilt almost fades out or just implies continuation off into the beyond. But different shades would play different relationships. Most commonly, I would go with my mid-tone or a mid-tone there. So the darks play a little dark, the lights play a little bit lighter, but essentially I have this almost borderless border except here where those off colors might hit that border, that frame, you're gonna get this hard stop. Or do you want to play with a true hard frame? And that would be a lot like matting a print is that you're going to then give it a defined space that frames it and hits the edge, which is really gonna keep the eye in and, in, and it implies a certain containedness of that system versus otherwise. Of course, we can always do, which I probably would with this one, is take an odd bit of color and pop it somewhere. Maybe even just fussy piecing into the binding, that one spot where this one bit of the off color can go on outwards, whereas still framing it essentially with my yellow. And I get then an openness and then a further emphasis of that continuation. Binding plays a big, big role with a minimalist quilt because, again, those little nuances, every detail truly matters. And that's where you might even just pop in a little bit of color in just one spot that's completely off which then will change the balance and the relationship of your color components within the design of the quilt. And that's where, with this quilt behind me over here, we'll really see how the binding can become not just a nice bit of color play, but we can become an important part of the concept and the content and the idea of the quilt. This one is playing off of the whole cloth tradition, which in its own way is essentially dealing with a lot of the same ideas as minimalism. The piecing is reduced, it's a single piece of fabric, but the quilting itself, it becomes the design. It becomes about the texture and that which we don't immediately see, but find details in closer examination. In this one, it is part of a series of self-portraits I'm doing, and it is just a white whole cloth in which I quilt into it in my own handwriting the phrase, I am tired of being sick, about 580 times, as a way of sort of dealing with that monotony of having a chronic illness, which many of us have, and just repeating that. But there we see in that quilt, there's the pop of two colors in the binding, and what that's there for in the bottom right is to draw the eye over there, not just for the fun of it, or a pure design element, but because just a little bit in from that binding pop, I have pulled the phrase, I am tired of being sick out one time and done it in this pale green. So one pop may lead us to another bit of difference. So what you're really working with with these structures, with the minimalist process, is how I can make small gestures that move the eye around and then lead you to something important that you want them to find, a little bit of quilting, throwing in a bit of hand stitching. Any little detail that's resonant for you can now take on great significance. And that's really the glory of minimalist quilts and why I hope you will all consider bringing them into your vocabulary. And I'll see you on the next episode. Thomas Canower Design Studio is sponsored by Old City Quilts. Discover quilting paradise between New York and D.C.